Amen. I, I want to welcome everyone here. Uh, if you're visiting the church, we're starting a brand new series, uh, and this is all about heaven. For four weeks, uh, Pastor Sam, uh, he wanted to jump in on my heaven series. He wanted to know which one he could do, and I told him he wasn't allowed to do any of them, okay? This is all mine. I said, um, this is my subject. I really enjoy this, and but I was very disturbed when I saw Luke walking off the altar with a hot dog. Did I see him up here with a hot dog? It was, I was, if you're down at the cafe, I want to let you know, I, I was walking over from the youth building, and I saw these young kids, and they're walking around, and they go, these hot dogs are free. So stop on up after the service, and hope you enjoy that. All right, um, there is so much I can say about this subject matter. And just so you know, if you um, are new here at the church, this is a four-week Bible study. So if you came to my Bible class, uh, as I've had, then this is what you would get. So we're going to study the Bible. Everything, anything that I know that the Bible teaches about heaven. So we're going through a lot of verses. Now, I could write a book a jam-packed book of beautiful stories that intrigue us about people that were dying. Let, let me just give you a couple, and I'll, I'll put some names here. Let's see. Uh, Margaret Ransom. This goes back many years ago. How many of you remember Margaret? Years ago, the donut lady, okay? Just a few of us here, and maybe down at the cafe. Uh, she had, we had a donut table downstairs. She ran that. She loved the Lord. Our new church is getting built on her family's property. That, that was theirs. And um, so Margaret, she called me up one day, uh, loved the Lord. She asked me and another minister to come to her house. So we went down there. She had been lightly sick, but she seemed to be fine. She said, I have something very serious I want to talk to you about. And we asked what it was. And she said, I want to die. I do. I'm not depressed. I'm not discouraged. My work on earth is finished, and I'm ready to go home to heaven. Well, of course, you know, we were teasing back and forth, and like, Margaret, come on. We were talking about things she should be doing. She goes, no, it's over, and I'm ready to go. She goes, but I want to know, is it okay for me to pray that I die in my sleep? And I thought about it, and I said, well, I can't say it's wrong. I, I said, well, so at the end, she wanted us to pray with her, and she prayed with us that soon she would go to bed one night, and she would just wake up in heaven. She said, now, I wanted you two ministers here, because when you find out that this happened, she goes, I want you to tell people. I'm going to let you know this wasn't an accident, and I'm so excited. We walked out of there, and the other minister said, well, that was really odd, and I, I said, it was, and, but she was a wonderful Christian. Days later, I got a phone call for an emergency at her home. I went down there. Gail, that comes to our church, she's probably down at the cafe. Uh, Gail, I know you're down at the cafe. Raise your hand real quick. She's down there. She's always down there at this time. And that's her daughter. Lives in that house now. And so here they said, we don't know what happened. She went to bed last night, and she just never woke up. Amen. Okay, that's God. Okay, I, I hate to be so personal. There's so many tons of them. I, while we're sitting here, Stephen, Stephen, raise your hand right over here. Your mama. I loved your mama. So Betsy. Betsy used to sit right up here. And so I kind of memorized where people sit in church. And so Betsy, they, oh, they had a wonderful family relationship. But Betsy loved me. I want to let you know, I went to her home one day, and there was a big picture of me and her on the mantle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I felt like a million dollars. Oh, yeah. Every, everybody should have a picture of the pastor on the mantle, just so you know that. I, I can expect to see that in your home. Oh, so Betsy said to me when she got cancer, she goes, I have a request. And I said, what? She goes, nobody's ever asked me this. She goes, when I die, I want you there with me. I want you to pray with me. And I die. Okay, nobody's ever said that to me. I thought, wow, that's uh, okay. And oh, so she was getting sicker with cancer. So I'd be with her by myself, and I'd be praying with her at the hospital, and she'd be intent. She goes, no, you, you pray that I'm going to die, okay? Okay, okay, Betsy. So I'd be, oh, God, I pray you're going to take home Betsy, So, which has happened many times. But as soon as I would say amen, she'd look at me, and she'd go, <laughs> I felt like I was really disappointing her. I was like, 
oh man, I feel really bad. Okay, now this story is backed up by many. So what happened was we were tag teaming her daily. So Sam would go one day, I'd go to the next. So Sam said, okay, Tay, my turn. I'll go. He said, okay. So my wife and I went to another hospital. I was at this hospital and something hit me like a brick wall. And I went to my wife. I go, I, I don't know. I, I feel like for some reason I need to get over to Betsy. Or she was like on hold. My wife said, why? Sam's there. I go, I know. So we're going all the way to the hospital. We were really behind in schedule. She said, Mike, you know Sam is there right now? Why are you going there? I go, I don't know why I'm going there. I just, I just got to get there. So I pulled up in front of the hospital. I said, listen, I don't even want to park the car. You just sit in the driver's seat. And, and so she sat there. I ran, I ran, you know how long it is getting in a hospital. I ran the length of the downstairs of the hospital. I'm jogging in a suit. I ran up the steps because I was afraid the elevator wouldn't be quick enough. I got to the floor. I ran then to the other end of the hospital where she was. I got in the room. I was out of breath. I sat down right beside her. Now, she had been kind of out of it for a couple days. I sat down. I put my hand on her head. I said, Betsy, it's time to go home. And she went, she was gone. Okay, now we get done. I'll, I'll tell you one more, one more. Listen, I'm tired. Okay, one more. I'll tell you one more. I'll quit. Mrs. Crozer, are they any of the Crozer children or grandchildren in the church here? Okay, oh, there we go. There, Kathy. I went to see her mom. She called from Allegheny Hospital. She had a big emergency. Her health was up and down. And so I got to the hospital. She goes, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike, I got to tell you what happened. Before this, she was fighting for life. So I said, What? She goes, This morning, my heart went for an all-time low. Everyone come running into the room. And she goes, and just then, I could see them, but the room got real misty and foggy. And then I saw him. Okay, now her husband was like a Bible teacher. He was, loved God. She goes, I saw him. He was at the end of my bed. And I knew he was ready for me to come home. And he had a big smile on his face. She goes, then he went away. She goes, I'm so mad. <laughs> she goes, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. And every time I'd see her, she goes, I want to go. Okay, then she was back in her nursing home. So she was going to the nursing home. I walked in, and there she is. She's going across, and she's pushing this, pushing this little cart so she can walk, and she's yelling at people. She goes, anybody want to get on the gospel train? I'm going to heaven. I want to take everybody with me. I'm, this is crazy, isn't it? I love that lady. Okay, now, that's enough. Let's get into the Bible, okay? This is for real. Okay, first of all, heaven is referred to as a country and a city. Hebrews 11, verse 16, talks about those who are martyred for their faith. And it said they were able to do it. How? They desired a better, what? Country. Everybody say country. Country. That is a heavenly one. Let me just stop there. What is heaven like? I can prove this, but this is only four weeks, so I've got to shorten it up. Why did God create the Garden of Eden? Because the Garden of Eden is a picture of what heaven is like, but heaven is better. Well, what was the Garden of Eden like? You could run through the Garden of Eden. There was no thorns for your feet. The grass only grew so high, and it didn't have to be cut. There were no weeds. There were no mosquitoes. Uh, the bushes were kept. They didn't have to be trimmed. How many of you have been to Disney World or Disneyland? Raise your hands. Okay. Okay, now when you go there, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful, isn't it? I, you guys love going there. They're like Disney crazy. Okay, everything's perfect. Why? 24 hours a day, people are working on the property. They're cleaning, they're cutting, they're planting 24 hours a day, and everything is kept perfect. How many of you ladies like to keep your home like super duper clean? Do I have any ladies? Okay. How many of you ladies or men like keeping your outside looking nice all the time? That's me. Okay. Okay. Now, but it just keeps getting dirty. I'm real hard on people on the church property. I want the pond looking right. I want the little pond looking good. I want the fountain looking good. When Sam's preaching, I didn't have anybody to take care of. I'd come up early Sunday morning. I would take care of it myself. I want it to be looking nice. Okay, but we have to keep cleaning, don't we? We have to keep painting. We have to keep planning because this is in heaven. Okay, we're going into a country. Did you ever go out into nature? How many of you have gone out? You were on an island, you were in the woods, you were on a mountain, and you could feel the presence of God. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, that's for real. Because the life of God is the life that is in nature. Okay, so 
heaven is likened unto a country, rich green grass and trees and bushes and flowers you've never seen, colors that you've never seen, fragrances you've never smelled. Okay, but it's also referred to as a city. Look in Hebrews 11 verse 10. It said they were accepting being cut in half or nailed to a cross, these martyrs, because they were looking for a city uh, in verse 10, for a city that has its foundations and designer and builder is God. Now, you've heard me say at funerals and others about the golden streets and the pearly gates. It's a little more complicated than that. But it takes too long to explain. That's why I'm taking these four weeks. The holy city that we read about in the book of Revelation, it doesn't exist yet. But, this, but where heaven is right now is likened unto a city. What does that mean? When we read about the golden streets, the pearly gates, the river of life, and all those things, for the future, future heaven, what is there now is likened unto that, such as beautiful. Man cannot create anything as beautiful as God creates. When you go on vacation to some of these des destinations, you're not going there for the hotel. You're going there for the beach. You're going there for the mountains. You're going there for the palm trees. You're going there for the sunrise and the sunsets. Isn't that correct? Okay, man cannot create the beauty that God has created. And that beauty is a reflection of what heaven is like now and for all eternity. Get this concept down into your brain here. Heaven is constantly changing. So in the Old Testament, heaven used to be in the center of the what? Earth. That's right. So re you read about it. Uh, Jesus told the story of the rich man, the poor man. Rich man was not a believer, had nothing to do about money, but he trusted in his riches. The poor man was a believer. God permitted the rich man who was in hell to see the poor man being carried off into heaven. Bible says, says hell is in the center of the earth. Heaven used to be in the center of the earth, but heaven was called, it starts with a P. It was called paradise. That's right. So the Bible says there was a great gulf between the two. Then when Jesus hung upon the cross, those people could not go into the presence or before the throne of God until the blood of Jesus Christ was shed even for them in the Old Testament. So God was up in the third heaven, the first heaven is the home, the Bible tells us, of the birds. The second heaven is the home of the moon, the sun, the stars. And the third heaven is above that. You know, they talk about that black hole up there. I have a suspicion about that one, okay? That might be the tunnel, which is above the second heaven of space. So when Jesus was resurrected, the Bible says he took everybody who was in paradise. They came up through the ground. Okay, a little golden nugget here. On the day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, on that day, if you remember, the Bible tells us that dead people who had just recently died re-entered their bodies temporarily, and people saw their dead loved ones come walking into the city of Jerusalem. That, that would scare you to death, huh? They were just passing through their bodies. God permitted that so people knew something miraculous happened. And then Jesus went marching into heaven with maybe multi-billions of people from Adam and Eve and Abraham and Moses and Job and all the rest of them following behind him into the third heaven. So heaven has been changing and heaven will continue to change as you will see. Now, some of these things are hard for us to conceive. Imagine a baby being in the womb. You know, I guess now we have the technology, we can visit them there. Uh, one of my children, they decided they have this special imaging where they can take a picture of the baby before the baby is born inside of the womb. Okay, that's just weird, okay? That's not, I mean, it's not a picture you wanna hang up in your house. Sorry, kids. <laughs> okay, but imagine we could go into the womb and we could talk to the baby. And we say, oh, you know, we can't wait till you meet the family dog. And if the baby could talk, the baby would say, what's a dog? So in order for the baby to understand what a dog is, it has to look around in the womb to see what it can compare it to. And we don't want to get into that. So, Okay, so what we have, 
We can't be dogmatic that we totally understand. I can only tell you the absolute bare facts of what we know in the concepts of what we have in this world. Okay, I have some questions for you. Ready? Are there any animals in heaven? Yes or no? Yes, yes there are animals in heaven. A man said to me last night, said, if my dog is not going to heaven, then it's not going to be heaven for me. Sometimes your dogs are like your kids, aren't they? I've seen filming of them. And so, okay, but here, let me tell you what I do know. There are animals in heaven. Let me prove it just to a story you already know. The great prophet Elijah, the Bible says he never died. That's pretty awesome. It's like the rapture. So God sent down a chariot of fire, and it came down and picked him up. Guess what was pulling the chariot? Horses. Ah, uh, flying horses. So the horses picked him up. He jumped up in the chariot of fire, and these horses took off these heavenly horses and took him back to heaven. You say, well, I, I don't like horses. You're going to learn to love horses, and you're going to ride these horses. In fact, you are going to ride them back to the earth one day at the Battle of Armageddon. You say, I'm afraid of heights. Don't worry. You'll get over it, okay? And we're going to be on these flying horses. We're coming back to earth. Now, next week, I'm going to talk about, remember, heaven used to be in the earth, and now it's in the third heaven. Heaven then is going to move from the third heaven, and that sermon's called When Heaven Meets Earth. And you know more about this than what you think you do. Oh, we've been praying this for years. Here, help me with this. Um, thy kingdom. Oh. What's that mean? Bring heaven to earth. That's what it is. That's what we've been praying. That's next week's sermon. So yes, heaven's constantly transforming and there are animals in heaven and we don't know exactly what that means. But Pastor Sam told me to tell you that there are no cats in heaven. I don't think he just told me that. I don't know. I don't know anything about that. Okay, let me ask you this. Question number two. Will we recognize one another in heaven? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Let me take you to the story of transfiguration. Let's see, we had Peter, James, and John. They're with Jesus. Two men from heaven appeared unto Jesus, and the disciples announced who they were. Who were they? they were, it was Moses and Elijah. How did... Peter, James, and John know who those two men were. I mean, one of them had been dead for over 1,300 years. And they knew neither of them personally. They just knew. I like that. You know, when somebody comes along and you're trying to remember their name, it would be great if you knew their name, always. When Adam and Eve were placed in the garden and there was no sin, they had perfect minds. One thing I know, the Bible, God told them, I want you to name every one of the animals in the garden. They named them and they remembered them. Could they speak to each other without ever speaking? Maybe. These are things we just do not understand. But one thing I do know, whoever you've known in this life, when you get to heaven, you will recognize them and you will know them. What a beautiful thought. The worst day of your life is upon that day in which you close the casket on your loved one. That is, isn't it? Just a horrifying day. You can't prepare for that. It's very heartbreaking. And in the midst of people hurting over losing their loved ones, God writes this. Look with me in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. It says, one day we're going to be caught up together, everyone, with them. Who's them? Your loved ones. That's like a golden nugget. It says in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And I want to let you know, we number one are looking forward to seeing the one who died on the cross and made it possible for us to go there. Amen? But they're, they're a bonus point. And he says, and so shall we ever be with, always with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Uh, in, in this service, I'm looking at people, and I have buried your loved ones. I've buried your spouses, your siblings. I've buried your spouses. Some of you here, I've buried your children. I, I, had, I had a little group of people 
that I had buried their children. I had a mother that was there. I buried or was involved with the funeral of her daughter and three of her grandchildren that died in a fire just a few years ago. There's one thing that almost all of us have in common, just so you know. For those who have lost children and grew through it, there was a switch turned on inside of us in which we have our eyes on heaven, on steroids. And when we talk alone with each other, and we hear about people, things people are mad about, they're angry about, they're upset about, we think, isn't that crazy? We used to be like that. But now, we just have our minds and our hearts on heaven. Okay, number three, can those in heaven see what's happening on the earth? Yes or no? That was a split decision in the last service. The answer is yes. Look in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. The great tribulation is coming. The Bible says that we're going to be living in a political atmosphere. Listen to this closely. In which you, if you do not yield to them, and if you do not renounce your faith in Jesus Christ, you will be beheaded. Do you see what's going on over there in the Middle East? Do you know that they are the fastest growing religion in America right now? Just so you know that. Oh yeah, this is coming. Do not be afraid. The rapture, resurrection day is going to happen first. We're taking off. For those of you who have never trusted in Christ, you will be left behind. And if you trust in Christ at that time, you will be beheaded if you stand for Christ. Well, now we see dead people in heaven. There's a special place in heaven just for them. And while they're standing before the throne in Revelation 6, 9, said, I saw under the altar the souls of those who were slain for the word of God. This is a future event. And they say this to God. How long before you're going to judge and avenge our blood on those that dwell on the earth? There's two things I want to point out to you. Number one, as you're looking at a book of Revelation, as we're in heaven, the Bible says we can look upon the earth and watch the scenes of what's happening during the great tribulation. Well, these people are looking down on their loved ones, and they see what's happening. And they turn to God, and they say, well, how, how long is this going to go on? Okay, so first of all, they can see. Secondly, they don't know the Bible any more than when they left. Okay, now this is a warning. At the cafe, and up here, I want you to listen to me closely. Some of you have been saved for a long time, maybe even just a few years. You are the greatest mechanic. You can pull an engine apart. You know everything about all sorts of medical things. I mean, you're really, really smart when it comes to science. You're really good at math. You're, you're like a computer genius. But when it comes to the Word of God, you are very ignorant. And you stayed that way because you have no interest. Now, this is really a big, important issue as the weeks go on, and especially on week four. Okay, but you want to know the Word of God. These people don't know the Word of God because they weren't saved very long. You could go and explain to them what's going on, but when you get to heaven, you do not have any more knowledge of the Bible than what you have when you leave. It will be ever learning there. Are we going to miss our old lives upon the earth? Yes or no? No. How many of you have flown first class on a plane? Here in the cafe, raise your hands up high. If you've flown first class, raise your hands up. Okay, I see all you people. Okay, look at all these snobby people in church <laughs> that fly. <laughs> Some of you, I, I could have picked out that you flew first class. I, you just had that lock in. So, okay, now sometimes we fly first class because of business. Other times we get bumped up into first class. Okay, I got bumped up into first class because they didn't have my economy seat. They made a mistake. Oh, yeah, that was nice. Now, if, you get, if you're in economy and you get bumped up into first class, after about an hour into the flight, do you think, oh, well, like I really miss being in the back of the plane. I miss sitting right beside the bathroom there, you know. I, I really miss that. And I wish I could go back. No, I don't think so. And my wife and I, we, we lived in a camper when we were in college. We started out raising the two little babies in the camper. I've never heard my wife say with tears in her eyes, Mike, I wish, I wish we could go back and move into the camper. No, uh-uh. Once we get there, we're not going to want to come back. And let me tell you a little more of a surprise here. Please do not feel bad for people who die. 
unless they went to hell. Now, listen to me very closely. I'm going to be very blunt about this. If you have never trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you can't remember that moment, had nothing to do with the church, has nothing to do with your good works, has nothing to do with your baptism, if you do not remember a time and a place in which you realize, I am lost, I'm going to hell, Jesus died on the cross to pay for all of my sins, if you believe upon the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you trust in him, this is an event, and ask him to come into your life to save you, with the intention that you want to follow him, not because you're trying to get the preacher or your spouse off your back, then you will go to hell. You will not hear that in many churches. I say it because I just don't care if I offend you or not. And I mean it. I'd rather offend you into salvation and make you mad. I had a man one time. I told him he was going to hell. I mean, he was ready to beat me up. Then he searched into the scriptures and he trusted in Christ as his Savior. I'd rather take you off or scare you and get you to come to know Jesus than just let you slide on by, okay? A woman in our church was in a car accident with her family, and she died. They were trying to bring her back. She goes, I lifted right up out of my body, Pastor Mike. She goes, I, she was disturbed by this. She goes, I lifted up out of my body. She goes, I heard the music. I saw these colors. She goes, I saw this light. She goes, there was this emotion, this feeling. My, oh, my birds was gone. There was an excitement in my heart. I wanted to go. I wanted to go. I heard the family, the children screaming for me to come back. Mommy, mommy, come back, mommy. She goes, I didn't want to. I didn't want to. She goes, and the next thing, I got pulled right back into my body. And I have been so upset, and I can't tell them. I know they wouldn't understand. I understand. Because once you cross the line, you don't want to come back. Amen? Amen. Do not say, oh, I feel so bad that they died, no matter how old or young they are. When my son died, not for one moment did I feel bad for him. I knew where he was, and I knew just the concept of what he was experiencing. I felt bad for me, and his mom, and the other kids, and that's human. Okay, I'm going to tell you what is there. There is a temple there, just like we have a church. You don't have to go there to worship, but there is a temple there. Uh, look with me in uh, Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. And then God's temple in heaven was open. You know, there was a day in which you left the church doors open 24 hours a day. Do you remember that? Yeah. We can't do that anymore. There's bad people out there. Very, very sad. And, but the temple, the doors are always open. And we want to go to the temple. Now, I want to tell some of you, some of you say, well, Pastor, I want to let you know, I mean, I love God I really, really love Jesus, but you know, I, I really don't like going to church, and I don't like the church people, and you've got all sorts of reasons why you don't like them, but I really love God. No, you don't. Who are you fooling? You're just fooling you. You don't love God. Uh, Pastor Ron's son, Caleb Jaworski, uh, his graduation party's coming up. You said, well, I wasn't invited. Hey, let me tell you. You can crash any party you want with a gift, okay? If you don't have a gift, don't crash the party. <laughs> so I'm all excited. He's been here since he was like a month or two old. I'm so fired about it. We, we went and got the card. We've got our gift ready. We want to go to the party. I don't care who's at that party except for Caleb. And I want to go there and honor him because he is, he, I mean, he, he's the king of the party right now. Well, that's the way it is when we go to church, right? We go to church for Jesus. We go to church for God. We go to church on Thanksgiving. We go to church. And let me tell you something. You will be a happier person if you give your life away and you just want to live for him, serve him. Amen. Don't think about yourself anymore. Think about him. I said, oh, but there's not only a temple there. There is a throne there. I, I, I also have to say, my granddaughter, Quinn, we had her first birthday party last week. Oh, I was so, so excited. I mean, we want to help pay for it. We want to help work it. We want to buy gifts for it. Why? Because she, she's my granddaughter. I mean, she's gorgeous. She's beautiful. Thank God beauty skips a generation. 
I don't have to see Tony Tate. Tony, you're not coming to dinner. That's what you get. That's it. No, I'm just kidding. All right, here we go. Um, Revelation 4, verse 2. I was in the spirit. He's in heaven. And behold, there a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. We're going to see Jesus on the throne. We're going to see God the Father on the throne. And round about the throne is a rainbow. Rainbows are beautiful. It says it had the appearance of an emerald. It's green. Why is it green? Because green stands for grace. Green stands for safety. The rainbow, when you see it, the Lord's sitting on his throne, and the message is, you made it home safe. Isn't that awesome? So many wonderful things to look forward to. Now, there is a home in heaven. There's a city, and there's homes in the city, just so you understand. We don't quite understand all of this, but in John 14, verse 1, let's read this out loud together, everyone. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Now notice, I go to prepare. They're always preparing. They're always upgrading. They're always changing. And there is a home which is being put together for you. What is that like? I don't know. Okay, I know it doesn't have a bathroom. I mean, you don't need a toilet. You're perfect, right? Okay, ladies... You'll do your hair one time and it's over. Perfect forever. Guys, we never have to take a shower ever again. Amen? Because we never get dirty. We don't need a shower. We don't need a toilet. We really don't need a kitchen. Right now, I hate to break the news. I'm not sure if I said this earlier, too many services. But right now, they do not eat in heaven. They're in spiritual bodies. And they don't care. When we're raptured, we're going to eat. Okay, how many have been on cruise ships? Cruise ships with all those restaurants. And it'll be something like that. The Bible says there's banquet tables, and we can eat, and you can gorge, and you'll never gain weight. It's like no calories in that food. And, um, but we don't need a kitchen. All the food is prepared for us. I, when I think of heaven, in my mind, I think to myself, I'm going to have my own little balcony out there with a big cushioned chair, which I'm going to curl up on. Just overlooking the kingdom. What a wonderful day that will be. Some people have the assumption that heaven is boring. The devil has put that in your mind. He wants you to think the church is boring and church people are boring and, and heaven is boring because he's planning on taking you to hell. And I mean that very strongly. Heaven is not boring. You want to trust in Christ. It's not in your verse. Here's a bonus verse. Ready? If I didn't give you enough. Psalms 16, verse 11, it says in heaven, we'll enjoy pleasures forevermore. You know those highlight moments you're like, the wedding, the birth of the baby, the graduation of the child, the graduation party. Those highlight moments is what every moment in eternity will be like. Let me ask very personally at the cafe and up here, are you feeling overwhelmed with life? I'm going to admit this. Many times I feel overwhelmed. Do I have anybody else say, I, I feel very overwhelmed. I, you feel overwhelmed trying to make money. You feel overwhelmed trying to take care of sick parents and take care of your children. You feel overwhelmed with a spouse that's ill and you're trying to take care. You're overwhelmed with a child in their illness or your own illness or your own pain. When you're home with the Lord in heaven, you will be free of all of that. Oh, look with me in Revelation 14, verse 13. Oh, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Those are believers, not the others. That they, everyone, may everyone rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. The deeds we'll talk about in week four. The labor will be gone. The stress will be gone. I don't know about you. I take care of a lot of stuff. I do a lot of stuff. And I think to myself, when I go running down that heavenly path, and I want my son on my greeting committee, and we're going jogging to the kingdom, I'm going to think to myself, I'm free. I don't have to take care of no one. I don't have to worry about the bills. I don't have to worry about fighting with this stupid city of Pittsburgh about building that new church. You know? I don't have to worry about raising millions of dollars to do that. We don't have to worry about nothing. 
We're going to be like little kids in our father's house, and he's going to take care of you. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Don't fall for the seduction of sizzle land on this earth. Because the devil wants to pull you away from this. I want you to get your focus. Get your focus in four weeks. I want you to live for the kingdom. I want you to live for the city. I want you to live for the rewards. I want you to have your mind every single day this week on the kingdom in heaven, in the holy city of God. An old ancient story, thousands of years old. A servant and his master went to Baghdad. And while they were there, a servant saw death in human form. And when he saw death... Death looked at him and gave him a threatening look. The servant went running for his life, and he told his master, please, I've got to leave Baghdad, and I have to go to Samaria tonight all day long. Let me travel there, or he's going to take me out of here. Well, the master let him go. The master went back into Baghdad, and he saw death still walking, and he boldly walked forward, and he said, why did you give my servant that threatening look? And death said, it wasn't a threatening look. It was a look of surprise. It was a look of surprise because I saw him in Baghdad. I have an appointment with him tonight in Samara. You know, weeks ago, uh, Larry and his wife, Kathy, were here at the church. They're very good believers here at our church, love God. He had joked me one day because both of us had children. We were having destination weddings out of the United States on an island. So I saw him the last Sunday. As always, was here at church. He had a countdown. He was waiting for this wedding. The kids told me, yeah, just count day. Oh, 40 days, 30 days, 20 days. What a wonderful thing. The height. We're at one of the children's weddings, and everybody's dressed up, and it's just family and we're in this beautiful atmosphere that looks like heaven and so they went there and they had the wedding and you could look on Facebook and you see the ocean behind them and the wedding pictures they went in for the reception and while they were there Larry just died he just died mid 50s man full of life no warning there's no guarantees is there Sooner or later, everyone runs out of time. Oh, but no one runs out of eternity. You're going to run out of time, but you're not going to run out of eternity. I, I know you don't know what I'm talking yet because it's coming. You're just wasting your time. Many of you are just wasting your time, and I mean this. You're wasting, you're, you're, you're just wasting your hours, you're wasting your time, and you're wasting your energy. Listen, you want to spend more time preparing for that, which will never end. And stop squandering your time. Just stop squandering your energy. Stop squandering your emotions over that which won't amount to a hill of beans. One day, it's a terrible thing to wait. He's old pastor. I'm just not ready. I'm just not, I'm not ready to be saved. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Or I'm not ready really to really totally wholeheartedly live for God. What are you waiting for? No one is ready. No one is ever ready. All you have is now. Let's pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you are not sure where you would spend eternity, if you're down at the cafe, if you're up at the church, listen to me. We don't have to make a big production out of this. Right now, sincerely in your heart, trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Pray this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe with all my heart in your death, your burial, and your resurrection. I, I believe that you hung on that cross and that you paid for all of my sins with your blood. At this moment, I ask for forgiveness of my sins. I believe and trust in you and you alone in your great work. I ask you to save me right now at this moment. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you truly trusted in Christ, I'm begging you, please, 
write that on a connection card. I accepted Christ so we can talk to you about this. And now, Father, as believers, we come before you. Oh, Father, I pray we stop wasting our time. I pray that we would stop wasting our energy on being bitter, on being unforgiven, on being petty, on being hurt. I pray that we would stop wasting our time, pouring our money and our time into junk, into things that will never amount to anything. I pray, Father, that we would have a balance that Jesus and the kingdom and God is number one. Oh, Father, that we'd live for the city, that we'd live for the holy city, that we'd live for the heavenly country. And now we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.